Shalom and welcome to Ne'er Le Reglai, Jewish Ministries, where we teach the Bible from a Jewish, historical, cultural, and linguistic perspective. We have now entered the month of December, and generally in the month of December, we have a focus on celebrating the birth of the Messiah, otherwise known as Christmas. Now, unfortunately, in Israel, the celebration of Jesus' birth, or the birth of our Messiah, is very much downplayed, and it is seen as something foreign, so you don't really see much activity regarding the Christmas celebrations here in the land of Israel. Now, that said, there are some uh, secular Jews who um, do something with a Christmas tree or something, or there definitely are like Arab Christians in the land, or some Gentile Christians, very small numbers, who will obviously celebrate in Bethlehem and um, even in here in Jerusalem and different places around Israel. However, the majority of the Israeli people, the Jewish people, uh, do not celebrate um, the birth of Yeshua as the Messiah because they don't believe he is the Messiah. Um, now, unfortunately, this also carries over into the, um, the Messianic Jewish community. The majority of Messianic Jews, from what I have seen, also do not observe um, this time of celebrating the birth of the Messiah or celebrating Christmas. And I think this is unfortunate. And um, I think there, there are some legitimate reasons for uh, questioning the date, for example, of December 25th, most likely not the date of um, Messiah's birth. Uh, and there was a lot of kind of paganistic or commercialism that has entered into the celebration of Christmas. However, um, there are so many beautiful things in remembering the birth of the Messiah, uh, in remembering the prophecies and seeing how they're fulfilled and telling the story, uh, that I think it's beautiful to uh, observe this time, to celebrate it, and to worship our Messiah, and to leave out the things that are a distraction. So that's what I want to do here, is simply focus on um, what we know to be true regarding the birth of our Messiah. And I'll be focusing this teaching um, on the Gospel of Luke, and seeing how Luke presents um, the details of um, the birth of the Messiah. In fact, I'm going to go one step back and even focus what Luke focuses on in the first few um, verses, and that is on the birth of the forerunner to the Messiah, uh, which is also an important part of this story. Now, Luke is unique in many ways. Uh, Luke was a physician who became a follower of Yeshua, and he uh, has a gospel with his name on it, right? So he recorded the events uh, of the life of our Messiah. And, um, and he also recorded the uh, Acts of the Apostles, right? The book of Acts. So these two um, just important books in the New Testament carry his name or are identified with him. And um, we're grateful for the, the hard labor that he put into um, getting the information to record the events of both our Messiah's life as well as the Acts of the Apostles. So um, as I begin this teaching, I want to focus on the first four, or I want to read the first four verses of Luke just to see how Luke begins his gospel before we get into um, the account of how John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah, came into the world. So Luke begins his gospel this way. Since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So he, in the beginning here, Luke explains exactly why he um, wrote this book, right? The, the Gospel of Luke, as we call it today. Uh, and that was to give a very carefully investigated document of the life of our Messiah, right? Um, and all the details surrounding that. And again, as Luke begins uh, in the in the, in the following verses, he focuses on the forerunner to the Messiah and how he came into the world. And he shows how God intervened in the lives of um, the parents of John the Baptist, who are Elizabeth and Zechariah. So let's continue in the Gospel of Luke, verses um, 5 to Five to seven. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of 
Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, and yet they had no child because Elizabeth was infertile, and they were both advanced in years. So this is, uh, again, details regarding the parents of John the Baptist. And, we, and Luke begins these this, these details with uh, explaining the, the time contextually. He explains how it was the during the reign of King Herod who reigned in Judea. And we know that King Herod reigned from about 37 to 4 BC. Now, we don't know the exact year of Herod's death. Um, it's somewhere between 4 to 1 BC. Um, and this is why there's some... Um, difference as well as understanding when our Messiah was born, because it kind of depends on the reign of King Herod and his death. But anyway, we know that both John and uh, our Messiah Yeshua were born somewhere in those years of, we'll say, between 6 and 3 um, BC, while Herod was still alive. Now, we also learn from um, the verses we read in Luke how both Zechariah and Elizabeth were from the priestly, priestly line of Aaron, right? Moses' brother Aaron was the first priest, and through him was the line of the priesthood. And Zechariah um, became a priest as well because the temple was still standing in his day. But they were both from that same lineage of um, the line of Aaron. And just to mention that we specifically read that Zechariah was from, or, or he was um, active in the division of Abijah, or in Hebrew it's Aviyah. And we'll, we'll come back to this at the end to see the significance of that. Now, we also read how both Zechariah and Elizabeth were counted as righteous, right? In verse 6, we read they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. So, does this mean that Zechariah and Elizabeth never sinned? Of course not. They were human, and so just like all of us, they sinned, and they needed the... Um, Righteousness that only God gives, right? But it was based on their faith in God and walking with God that they were considered righteous, right, in the sight of God. Just like Abraham and all of the um, list of uh, uh, righteous believers, right, from the Old Testament as we have in Hebrews 11, right? Anyone who walked in the ways of God was considered righteous. Uh, and that's still the truth today, right? Anyone who believes the truth of what God has revealed to us today, right, in believing in the Messiah. Um, that righteousness is counted to us because of our faith in God. So they were both considered righteous. Now, we um, we also read how they had no child, right? So it's kind of this this um, other side of the coin. They were, they were righteous in God's sight, and so they sort of ha should have had all the blessings that come along with that, including children, but they had no children, right? Because we read how Elizabeth was infertile or, or barren, right? And now they were older. They were advanced in years, and she was beyond the uh, years of bearing children. And so their hope had faded of having any children. And it's in this context that we are introduced to Zechariah and Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And I just want to point out here the meaning of their names because it's powerful as we understand the meaning of their names um, as God uh, interjects in their life and intervenes in their life because the very name uh, Zechariah in Hebrew is Zechariah and simply means the Lord remembers. And Elizabeth in the Hebrew is Elisheva and it means um, the oath of my God, right? Literally, my God, my God's oath. But we see in these two names, the prophetic declaration of our of the character of God, right? He is the one who remembers, the Lord who remembers, and he is the one who keeps his word, right? The God of my, the oath of my God. Um, so it's beautiful to, to see how God chose this particular couple with these names um, to to do a miracle in their lives, right? Because God was both remembering and keeping his word um, as he as he intervened in their lives, as we continue to read in the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we read this in verses uh, 8 to 10. Now it happened that while he, Zechariah, was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour 
of the incense offering. So as we continue to get the uh, details of what happened that day when, when Zechariah was um, going in to fulfill his priestly duty, uh, we read about how, again, he was doing it according to that division of, um, of uh, Abijah, Avia. Um, and we know that the, the priesthood was divided into 24 divisions, and each, each of the um, divisions would serve two weeks a year. Um, and then they would also, that would be 48 weeks in a year, and then they would also fill in the different holidays. And that's how the, um, the temple service was continually stayed active under the priesthood throughout the year. So Zechariah was serving in his division, but we also read how he was chosen by Lot to enter the temple and to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now, this may seem um, kind of commonplace because it was something that was done every day. However, burning incense on the altar of incense was something that was uh, a unique opportunity for the priests, especially in Zechariah's days when you had thousands and ten thousands of priests. And so it would be something that would be done only once in their life. So it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it was this day that um, during his service that Zechariah was granted the opportunity to go in and burn incense on the altar. So it was a great day of honor for Zechariah. And it was actually going to be much more than he could even have imagined. Now, we also read that as Zechariah entered into the temple to burn the incense on the altar, it says that everyone outside was praying, right? In verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. Such a beautiful picture of Zechariah going in to fulfill the law and burn the incense on the altar, um, which was a soothing aroma in uh, in God's sight, right? And everyone outside was praying. And we literally see this, um, this picture of incense and prayers put together in the book of Revelation, where um, in Revelation 5, 8, we read about how the 24 elders and the um, four living creatures, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, right? So uh, it's interesting that um, there's that understanding of how, how incense before the Lord is as prayers of the saints. And back in Luke 1, we see literally how it's being lived out. The prayers of the saints are going up at the same time that, that Zechariah is offering that um, incense on the golden altar. And it's just a beautiful reminder of how um, when we pray, it is something uh, that comes before God, right? And it is a sweet aroma in His presence. So let's be continually a people who pray with others in unity because it creates that, that, um, that sweet aroma in his, in his, uh, before his presence, right? Or in his presence. So let's be people expecting as well that God will move. I don't know if the people were expecting God to move, uh, at that time in the temple when Zechariah was, uh, burning the, the, burning the incense, but uh, we know that God did move as his people prayed and as, as Zechariah walked in obedience. So let's read the continued story here of what happens while he's in the temple. I'm just going to kind of complete the story uh, in verses 11 to 25 and read this whole section where we read this. Now an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John. You will rejoice you will, ha you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice over his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. In her years, the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and un unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which, were, which will be fulfilled 
at their proper time. And meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he repeatedly made signs to them and remained speechless. When the days of his priestly service were concluded, he went back home. Now, after these days, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with faith favor upon me to take away my disgrace among people. So it's an amazing story. And just kind of to summarize some of the main points here, we, we, we know how we see how God sent his angel Gabriel to speak to Zechariah to inform him that his prayers had been heard and his wife would become pregnant and bear a son whose name was to be John. Now this son, this child, John, was to be filled with the Spirit while still in his mother's womb, and he would fulfill the prophecy, which we now know is in Malachi 4, 6, to come in the Spirit and power of Elijah to call the people to repentance, right? So this this child would have a prophetic um, fulfillment as he lived out this um, proclaiming and preparing, proclaiming uh, repentance, pro- pro- preparing the people for the Lord's coming. Now, Zechariah struggled to believe the words of Gabriel um, because it was something he was not ready for at that time. We know that the angel said that this is an answer to your prayer, right? So Zechariah is literally praying about this, but in Zechariah's mind, it was the wrong timing. He was too old. His wife was too old. But we need to remember what it says in Isaiah 55, 9, as the Lord says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We need to remember that God's timing is always best. And when we pray, we often expect things to happen right away. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. But we need to remember to wait on the Lord. We need to continue to trust Him and know that His timing is perfect. So let's continue to be a people of prayer, uh, to pray and to have those uh, uh, prayers go up to Him like the incense that goes up from the altar. Now, as we think about the sovereignty of God um, and how his plans are often different from our plans, we, we see how he used this particular couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, who were considered too old in human standards to have children to bring the forerunner of Messiah into the world. Now, I think it's, um, it's interesting to see how we also know that God used a couple that were considered too young to have a child, Mary and Joseph, to bring the Messiah into the world. When I say too young, I don't mean so much age-wise, but she was a virgin and not yet married, right? We know she, they were a young couple, or at least she was young, um, but they weren't even married yet. They hadn't had sex yet, right? But God used um, this young couple that were not even married yet to bring the Messiah into the world. God used this couple that was too old to have children uh, to bring the forerunner to the Messiah into the world. So it's beautiful to see how um, God uses these um, difficult or impossible situations to bring about certain things so that he will receive the glory, right? God takes those unlikely circumstances so that he will receive the honor and not us. And so we need to trust him for the outcome to the things that seem impossible in our lives. Now, we also see how God showed kindness and favor towards Zechariah and Elizabeth in giving them a son. And in the very name that God said he was to be called, John, which in Hebrew is Yohanan, which means the Lord is gracious, right? So the Lord was literally explaining his act towards Zechariah and Elizabeth by the very name of Yohanan, the Lord is gracious. Now, I just want to conclude this teaching with one final detail, which I mentioned earlier about the order of the priesthood. Now, we see how Luke records uh, in great detail regarding how God chose the parents of John the Baptist while documenting Zechariah's priestly service as being of the division of Abijah, right? Or as I mentioned in Hebrew, it's Aviyah. 
And we also know from the scriptures that the priesthood was divided into these 24 units or divisions for service in the temple. So there's a complete list of these 24 divisions in uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 24. You can go back and read that yourself. I believe it was in the days of King David and, um, and the priest at that time. And so it's easy to remember 1 Chronicles 24 and the 24 divisions of the priesthood. Now, this is what we read in uh, 1 Chronicles 24, 7-11 about those first 10 divisions. We read this, Now the first lot came out for uh, Jehoarib, the second for Yedadiah, the third for Harim, the fourth for Seorim, the fifth for Malkiah, the sixth for Miyamin, the seventh for Hakoz, the eighth for Abijah or Avia, the ninth for Jeshua, the tenth for Shechaniah, right? So here are the first ten, and we see um, Abijah in there as the eighth, right? Um, so I want to focus now, I just want, I just want us to look at numbers eight, nine, and ten in a little more detail as we have them in this list. So it's interesting as we read about these in their sequence and as we understand the meanings of their name. So I've already explained to you that the name uh, Abijah in Hebrew is Aviyah, and Aviyah means the Lord is my father. Number nine is Jeshua, which is literally Yeshua, and this is the word for salvation. It's also the name of the Messiah, who is the Son of God and the Son of Man. And number 10 is Shechaniah, or in, literally it's uh, Shechaniahu in the Hebrew, and it simply means the Lord dwells. So here we see these three divisions, the first one, uh, the eighth one, I should say, right? But the first of the three being Aviyah, that's the one that Zechariah serves in. But the two after them are also very meaningful and speak volumes here. We see a clear prophetic uh, declaration of the Trinity in the priestly divisions of Aviyah, Yeshua, and Shechaniyahu. And just in case you didn't quite pick it up in the um, first uh, explanation of those words, let me just reiterate them. So Aviyah, again, is the Lord is my Father. So we clearly see a picture of Father God here. Um, Yeshua is the word salvation, and we know it's the name of the Son of God, right? The Messiah. Yeshua. And Shechaniyahu means the Lord dwells. And we know that the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is the one who dwells within believers, right? The Lord dwelling within us, as we have even uh, the words of our Messiah in John 14, 16 and 17 explaining that. So we see a clear picture of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in these minute details in the book of Chronicles, which gives us the visions of the the priestly service, right? The 24 divisions of the priesthood. And we see Aviyah, Yeshua, and Shechaniyahu. Now Luke uniquely details the manner in which God brought John the Baptist, the forerunner to the Messiah, into the world. And by doing so, we literally have a picture of the Godhead, right? God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and a declaration of our Messiah's name. And in the Gospel of Luke, he wasn't even he wasn't even named yet, right? The Messiah. We see it uh, later on. But um, we see these prophetic um, just revelations of who God is, even just in the, the introduction of the prophecy of John the Baptist through his parents, right? And going back to this minute detail of the priestly service. So again, just to put all these pieces together in this teaching, we have these different names with all their uh, meanings. Zechariah, Zechariah is the Lord remembers. Elizabeth is Elisheva, the oath of my God. Yochanan or John, Yochanan is the Lord is gracious, right? And we literally see how all these things were fulfilled in the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth through their son, Yochanan, right? As the Lord remembered them, kept his word, and was gracious to them. And then we have the three divisions of the priesthood. Uh, Aviyah, the Lord is my father. Yeshua, salvation, the name of our Messiah. And Shechen, Shechenyahu, the Lord dwells, right? So we have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit um, for us that are proclaimed in these names of the priestly service. Beautiful to see how the details, right, um, of the scriptures just continue to proclaim who God is. And so as we celebrate our Messiah's birth again at, at the 
uh, Christmas time. It's beautiful to tell the story and all the details of our Messiah's birth, including the be de details of John the Baptist and how God spoke into that situation and proclaimed God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, even through those names of the priestly divisions. God is in the details. It's beautiful to see it in the scriptures. It's, good, it's beautiful to be reminded of this. It's encouraging to our faith to see how God is faithful from beginning to end. So I hope you found this teaching to be uh, an encouragement and helpful. Please feel free to share it with others. Also want to invite you to partner with us, give a donation of any amount by clicking the Give tab today on our website or simply by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thank you so much. Have a blessed celebration of our Messiah's birth and see you again in the new year.